Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, audience. Welcome to Achieve Wealth Podcast. We focus on achieving wealth through value at real estate investing, uh, specifically in commercial real estate asset classes. Today, I have two great members uh, and guests from uh, Disrupt Equity. I have Faras Musa and Ben Suttles. Right. So, hey, hey guys, welcome to the uh, show. Hey, James, thanks for having us. Yeah, I mean, both of them own almost 1,300 units across eight deals with $70 over million dollars in asset under management. Um, their deals are primarily in Atlanta and Texas, uh, and uh, they have raised almost $20 million from uh, private investors up to now. So is there anything else that I missed out in your credentials? No, I think a little bit more than 20, but we're, we're approaching probably 25 at this point, but, okay. uh, you know, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty spot on, you know, a little bit of background about me. I come from the sales and business development background in the IT side, you know, so I know a lot of probably your listeners are probably either IT or engineering. We, we all seem to have gravitated towards commercial real estate in one way, shape or form, but, um, that's kind of how I got into commercial real estate about five years ago. Yeah, I guess maybe. Yeah, I mean, my background also in the engineering side, that was definitely software. So I used to be a program manager at Microsoft. Did that for a couple of years, left and had my own software company. And then like probably some of your listeners had extra capital figuring out how to deploy it and, you know, learn about real estate. Started with the, the single family space. And so first thing I bought was a fourplex, then a bunch of houses. And then I realized it was too much brain damage in terms of just scaling, right? I mean, it's a, you know, having 12 insurance policies and 12 tenants and 12 right. loans and 12 of everything is kind of a pain. And so, you know, learned about multifamily and then kind of the rest has been history. So I've been running with that since. Yeah, yes. I, I, I really dislike the insurance part of the single family because a lot yeah. of insurance expires at different time of the year. And That's my biggest <laughs> pain point, honestly. And I, I literally will, I'm willing to pay a premium for a broker that'll just take care of it. And I just don't have to think about it because it's just not worth the hassle of thinking through and, you know, spending the time and effort there. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you can pay like a monthly is the same amount and, uh, you know, it's all automatic, but insurance is one thing you have to print out and you have to scan and you have to do all kinds of things. Yeah. So, so let's go a bit more into the thought process here before we go into the details of your deals and all that. So three IT guys, right? I'm also with electrical engineering background with some software. Why do you think a lot of these IT guys like commercial real estate uh, investing, especially in multifamily? I mean, yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, I think it's the numbers, right? You know, I think it's, you know, you, you come from kind of an analytical side of, of the brain, right? And, and I think, in real estate, a lot of it's numbers driven. Now there's a there's a relationship side of the business, right? Which we all have to have. You have to have, you know, that 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 uh, that side of it to raise equity and you know obviously work with the brokers and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's a numbers game, right? You've got to be able to underwrite the deals. You got to be able to make you know uh, projections for uh, financial projections, and all that is numbers and spreadsheet driven. And I think that's a lot of why the IT and engineering guys, um, you know, get into the space. Also, I think the other thing is too, is that allows us to be creative, you know, when we're not able to be creative in some, some respects, whenever you're able to kind of put your stamp on the rehab of, of a property and improve that and, and, and kind of get out and roll your sleeves up. That's another thing that we, we were lacking probably in a lot of our jobs. And so I think at least personally for me, that that might be part of the reason why, I don't know, Ferris might have a, another take on it as well. Yeah, no, I, I'd say the numbers thing is definitely one of the biggest factors, but it's also, it's, it's a space that you can learn it yourself, right? Meaning, you know, a lot of engineers are willing to go above and beyond, spend the effort, research, read books, and learn it, right? You can do that in this space. And, you know, there's not like an engineering exam at the end of it where you have to do, you know, you have to pass, right? And so yeah. it's the kind of thing where you can learn it and it makes sense, right? The numbers don't lie. And so to engineers, right, it's like, you know, you can see a clear path of, you know, 
the progression, right? There's not like a leap of faith at any point in time. And then the other part of it too is problem solving, right? I think all engineers like problem solving. It's part of the challenge. And to me, that's what I like about multifamily. It's bigger and harder, right? Sure, I could have probably scaled out a rental portfolio if I really wanted to. But I mean, it's just not fun to buy, you know, hundred thousand dollar assets, hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's a lot more fun to do a bigger project, a bigger team, and really, you know, work through each issue as it comes up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my mind, is a lot about. Uh, I mean, real estate. You know, there's a lot of creative thinking that you need to put on, and that's really fun, right? Because you wanna. I mean, I'm I'm sure when you guys underwrite deals, we want to solve that problem, right? You want to yeah, break. Absolutely. You want to break that deal, right? Hey, why? Like for me, I always say, like, how how can I break this deal? Or why you should why you should work for me, right? That's why I think I'm sure you guys do that too. I, do, I was doing I was doing that earlier yesterday, man. Yeah, man. It's all about you know how do you how do you blow up the deal, right? How do you blow and, up you know, the deal? There must be something wrong in this deal. Let's find yeah. that out. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the funny thing. Whenever you have a deal that makes sense, it's like something's just not right. I'm just going to offer lower than I might have otherwise <laughs> because something just doesn't make me feel 100. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when you yeah. find a deal that makes sense, you're like, oh, let's try to break it. Something must be wrong, and when you can't break it, then then it makes sense. Then okay, that's a deal. Yeah. yeah. That's the one that and then the other part too is that it's it's a people game, right? I mean, so something some engineers might not like it, but at least me, I mean, I think Ben's same. It's, we like it because it's, it's it's a team effort. It's not one person. It's how do you you know combine people, really get the you know get the thing done, both on you know on the GP side as well as the operations side, right? How do you build rapport with your manager, with your you know your, your regional, whoever it is, right, and kind of help accomplish the goals and give them motivated. So to me, that's part of the fun. Yeah, so I, mean, I feel like it's on, what we do is like touch, project management on steroids. <laughs> and Ferris, you touched on something that that was that was really interesting too earlier, which was the project management piece, which I I had forgotten about. I mean, a lot of us come from big, you know, we've done big projects, we've worked with teams, and let's be honest, this is a team sport, right? Absolutely. You know, this is you know, yes, you could you could maybe be solo and, and respect, but you've got a team on the background, in the background that's helping you accomplish your goal, and you've got a project management or manage that whole entire process in order to get it to close. And then even after you're closing it, right. In order to asset management or to do the asset management, to do the construction management, you know, and, and for you, James, too, you do the property management. Correct. All of that stuff is a, is a, is a, you're juggling a lot of different pieces and making sure that the ball is continuously moving forward towards that goal. And I think a lot of it and engineering folks come from that background, understand that. So, once you can kind of segue that into the commercial real estate space, it's just essentially just project management at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Even my, even my throughout my 22 years in corporate world, you know, I think 16 years I was a manager and I was also a project manager and, and I was a very good project manager. And it, it all that translates to, you know, this multi-million dollar business that you're managing, right? Because yep. you need to make sure your transactions happens correctly. You need to make sure you communicate to people, right? That's what, we all learn in project management. Right? How do you over communicate? How do you make sure people don't mess up? How do you take proactive action to de-risk a project? Right. So that's that's how the game is played, even in the commercial real estate in this hot market. And it's never going to be straightforward, right? There's always challenges. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, you know, that's that's where you know where 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 those project management skills really kind of come into play because you know anybody can run a smooth project, right? Where nothing ever bad happens. But let's just be honest. There's always something that happens. Yeah, and so yeah. you have to you have to have that that acumen to be able to to keep that 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 ball moving forward towards that common goal. Yeah. So apart from the you know the IT education itself, do you guys think that your work experience, the classes that you have been at your workplace, and the environment that you have gone through, I mean, has given certain edge to uh, to you guys as well? Uh, I would say abs- absolutely. Like I said, I mean, what we do is project management on steroids, right? And so <laughs> having done that for years, ha- knowing how to keep track of multiple projects simultaneously. That's the other thing too, right? A lot of people will, you know, get into the business and they realize like, hey, syndicating start to finish is not not a walk in the park. There's a lot that happens both with lending and legal and issues come up. And, you know, they, they it's a lot to keep track of. And then if you try to do two deals at a time, right? Now it's you know, it's not really two X, it's kind of a squared, you know, of the issues. So I would say absolutely. Right. And then the other thing that we've seen, you know, being on the tech side is how do we differentiate ourselves with other people too, right? How do we, you know, create a better impression for investors? How do you, you know, position everything, you know, professionally, right? All of our stuff is mobile friendly. All of our stuff is, you know, certain ways. And those are things that I've brought, at least from the tech world to make sure that we kind of do and, you know, do well. 
Mm. Yeah, and I think I think efficiencies, right? That you know, you come from that IT engineering background. It's all about productivity, efficiency. You know, how can we automate things? And 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 and, and James, you probably saw the same thing when you got into the space. It's completely fractured. A lot of it is backwards or outdated. And there's a there's a lot of you know low hanging fruit stuff of ways that can be improved. And and I'm sure your your team is looking to do that constantly. And so are we. You know, and that's all com- that comes from our background, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I told Ben I have to stop myself from wanting to start a software company every <laughs> few months because you you know, being an entrepreneur right. and being a software guy, it's like, man, this place. Some of the stuff of what we do is pretty archaic. Yeah, yeah. I think real estate is the last, you know, most uh, what you call a final frag- frontier, <laughs> fragmented. Uh, industry you know that is you know they're like something like ai or something is going to take over soon right because there's so much of uh, inefficiency yeah it, it, you can you can you can take it to an extent but then there's that personal side that relationship right. side right you know and i think that's kind of that, that's that's one of the parts that i took from 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 you know my former job which was you know uh, so a lot of sales and business development work as well right you know i mean Taking that that networking, that relationship building side, that building rapport side, you know, into this space. But you know, I mean, I agree. That I think there's there's software and AI and, and these types of things are going to automate a lot of that back office part of the process, and maybe even the um, the analysis piece. But there's always going to have to be those two people coming together to make a deal happen, yeah. right? Because right. ultimately, it's going to be one person or one group and trying to sell, and one group trying to buy. And you have to come to some kind of an agreement, right? You know, and then even after you buy it, right, there's always those relationships with vendors and employees and all those different things that you have to kind of manage too. But, you know, anything that we can that we can bring and that we've seen in our past gig where we can make that more efficient here, we're, we're obviously trying to introduce that. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So let's go back to the business side of it. So... What are your guys' focus uh, in terms of market? Uh, in, right now, currently, Atlanta and some cities in Texas, right? Why don't you guys talk about why did you choose these two markets? Yeah, so in terms of why we chose them, I mean, the same reason you're probably in San Antonio to some degree, <laughs> right? You know, we're looking for strong, attractive markets that are not single industry that are growing, right? Population and, you know, on the this business side. And then, you know, really the important thing for us too is yield. Right. And so that's why we got into San Antonio too, is that we can't find returns in Houston. We look at a lot of deals in Houston. We're based in Houston. We don't own anything in Houston. Right. We're looking for returns that we can, you know, that that will actually do we're looking for deals that'll give actual returns for our investors. That's also why we don't look in Dallas, right? Price points are too high that you're having to pay so much that you basically have no, you know, no yield on the deal. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of what really, you know, got us into Atlanta, got us into San Antonio as well. And you know, Beaumont's kind of a slightly different story, but those are the things that we look for. And then, you know, in terms of future deals, right, future markets. So, you know, we've really kind of managed to, I would say, streamline a lot more of our acquisition pipeline, right, in terms of underwriting deals, identifying deals, and really keeping a pipeline going. And so, you know, what that's allowed us to do, especially with a full-time asset manager now, is we can look at a lot more deals. And so, you know, we've kind of identified two markets that we want to get into, hopefully this year, Orlando and North Carolina. And, you know, that just, just to give us, just to keep our pipeline going, right? So we can keep looking at more and more and more deals, you know, with hopefully finding something that makes sense. Absolutely. So how do you guys choose your market? So like now you say Orlando and North Carolina, right? So I have a lot of stats on Orlando because it's, I know it's growing very quickly. So let's take North Carolina. Why did you guys identify North Carolina? I mean, I think, I think all of it boils down to population growth job growth, you know, we also like to find areas, you know, and that's not every single market, but I I like to see a good concentration of different universities and colleges as well, because I feel like a lot of the bigger corporations are going to follow where they're going to have a good funnel of potential students to, to take from as well. So we'll look in college towns as well, too, because you know, but let's be honest, North Carolina, it's got, you know, the research triangle, it's got a, it's got a ton of universities. And, you know, it's kind of being called the Wall Street of the South. You know, the, the problem with North Carolina is that we're not the only ones looking there. So it's, it's pretty competitive there, too. But it's got a lot of those good data points that we like to see in terms of population and economic growth okay. that, you know, you see in Texas and in Georgia. And, and you know, really, you know, we were, we were looking in Texas for quite some time. And 
we found Georgia was very, very similar in a lot of ways to Texas, you know, and so that's the reason we started kind of focusing on Atlanta as well. But it, it ultimately boils down to, you know, is there enough population job growth to continue to drive demand for the workforce housing that we're that we're looking for? So people are always like, well, you know, you're not you're not renting out to Fortune 500 folks, so why do you care about that? Well, I'm saying, well, the ancillary service companies and service jobs that are going to feed into this white collar jobs is what we're what we're looking for. So if you don't have any of the Fortune 500 stuff, right? then there's not any real need for a lot of the infrastructure where a lot of these people are going to be working. So, you know, when you, when you look at it in Texas and when you look at it in Georgia, right, a lot of those people are there. So there has to be service workforce type jobs that are going to have to be feeding into that. And that's why we like those markets. And, you know, we see a lot of that same type of thing happening in Orlando and, and, you know, some other markets in, in Florida and as well as North Carolina. And, you know, we've looked in Tennessee, we've looked in some other spots as well, but, you know, from from us, we've got so much deal flow coming in that you know, in order for us to to be a little bit more strategic, we're as a team, we've decided to focus on about three or four major markets, and then you know, just go deep on those, and then we can go horizontal and find other markets in the future. Got it. So let's yeah. say now today you're getting a deal, right? Let's say from North Carolina. What are the steps that you guys take? So today. Let's say, I mean, how do you guys get deals nowadays? Is it through broker relationship, off market, on market? How are you guys sorting out the deal flow? Yeah, everything in between. (laughs) A lot of it is brokers. A lot of it is people that know us as buyers, people that, you know, know we we will get the deal closed, right? Whether it's broker that knows it and they might know, you know, a seller. One thing I tell every broker is like, hey, if you have a deal that you don't have the exclusive on and you need someone to make a preemptive offer to try to get that locked down. Like we're your guys, right? Mm-hmm. So you find ways to motivate the broker or motivate other people that know someone that knows someone. So we, I mean, really deals come in all shapes and forms. And so, but for us, you know, the, the biggest volume is definitely the brokers, mm-hmm. but it's really, it's not about the ones that they just email out blast it. Right. It's really about, the follow-up deals that maybe are near, you know, getting to the finish line, getting the finish line in terms of the, in terms of the marketing, but they haven't had any much interest or, you know, for whatever reason, right? So I think that's important. So, you know, once a deal comes through in terms of the analysis side, we obviously dig into the T12, dig into the OM, but more so, importantly, talk to the... Sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying that what do you look for first in the deal? When you get a, so you get a deal, what do you look for? What are the, what do you, what's your sniff test? Because I don't think so you guys yeah. underwrite everything, right? What's your sniff test? I'll, I'll tell you what my first sniff test is. I look at what the average rents are and what their price point is. And then I can okay. deduce from that, right? Is this okay. going to be, you know, anywhere? And really what I'm doing kind of mentally is ballparking what the cap might be, right? Mm-hmm. But really I'm looking at what are the average rents and what is the purchase price, right? And then, you know, is there, are they close enough that I think that there's some meat on the bone? Right, is really what it boils down to. I mean, I'll give you a real example. There was a deal in Atlanta that I so North Atlanta. Atlanta is a really unique market. North Atlanta is really expensive. South Atlanta is complete opposite. And mm-hmm. there's a deal that came through on the northern side, and you know, I think the average rents on that deal were like you know eight hundred fifty, nine hundred dollars. So I'm like, hey, this one might be at a reasonable price point, right? And so I'm like, mm-hmm. in my head, mentally, I'm like, okay, let me call the broker. If this is eighty, maybe ninety, you know, there's there's a deal to be had here. You call the broker, and it's one hundred and thirty a door. Right. So, I mean, that already instantly ruled it out. And so you're really looking for some of those kind of low hanging fruit just to figure out, okay, is this deal even in the ballpark for us to look into anymore? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think, you know, the first sniff test, James, is is really, I mean, the location of it too. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting deal flow in these places that we want to be. And we've identified different pockets within those sub markets that we want to be in. Mm -hmm. So if it's not within one of those pockets, then we're automatically you know, putting that to the side. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a deal there, right? Yep. So those are usually kind of the maybe deals, you know, and we're, we want to kind of circle back. Maybe we're bored or something. We want to see if that one. That's exactly. Work. <laughs> Whenever we're bored, we go back and look at those deals. <laughs> yeah. We'll go back and take and take a look at those. Right. But we're looking for that are going to fit in that, that those sub market pockets, right. That we like. And then from there, right. Just like, you know, what Ferris was saying, you can almost, you can almost immediately tell if it's going to work. Right. You know, you pencil out so many deals. I mean, we at this point, we've analyzed hundreds and hundreds of deals. So you can on, on, almost look and say, oh, that's not going to work for us. Right. Just based on what they're asking for. And you can also kind of tell that, too, you know, by the price per pound versus, you know, sometimes the median income of the area. Right. You know, I mean, is, are you going to be able to achieve the rents that it's going to that's going to take? 
to make that deal work. And if you're going to be maxing out your median income, then it's not going to work either. So a lot of the things that, you know, we look at population growth, we look at, you know, job growth, all those things too. But, you know, one of the things that we also look at is the median income, right? You know, and a lot of these is workforce housing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, you look at, you know, what's the, what's the average rent? You know, we're usually doing the three X income test, you know, whenever we're taking prospective tenants in, right? You know, like everybody should. And then you determine, you know, what the median income level is. And if you're going to be maxing that out, you're going to be above that, then the first sign that something is, is, is going wrong, those people are going to skip. They're going to stop paying rent, right? So you want to make sure that you're under that, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be at the top of the market. Yeah, maybe they can keep up with it for a month or two, but they're going to get it behind. And so we're yeah. very, very cognizant of that. And to add, though, it's, it's not that, you know, if it's a lower income area, we won't buy a deal there. Or if it's a high oh, income yeah. area, we won't. It's really, you know, these are just kind of rules of thumb. And then from that, you start to work back. Okay, well, if it's a lower income area, you can assume that your economic occupancy is going to be much lower. So you should underwrite it that way, right? Because there's a deal to be had anywhere, right? I mean, I'll buy any deal at the right price point, right? Mm -hmm. Assuming as long as it's, to me, at least it's in, a, it's in a growing market, right? And it's not a deal that I have to worry about the city, you know, essentially no one even wanted to live in that general area. But in terms of price point, in terms of, you know, average incomes, all of that, it's really, again, dependent on what price point are we buying it at. So yeah. let's say the uh, rent and the price point seems reasonable, right? At the first uh, sniff test, what's your next level sniff test? What do you guys do? Then, and actually, sorry, the thing I do before that is actually call the broker and just get their spiel. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> That's actually the, the first, you know, usually, right? Because a lot of times there's more to the story, right? Is yeah. it, you know, is it a partnership where, you know, one of the sellers passed away and they're looking, you know, they're a little bit more motivated? Or is it a deal that just, you know, the bro I've had brokers literally tell me these sellers are terrible operators, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can kind of, and if you have a relationship with a broker, they'll be honest with you about that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Brokers are all, you know, a lot of times brokers, I don't want to say always, but they'll always, a lot of times will say, yeah, you know, you could do this and this and get, you know, a $200 rent pop, right? Yep. Take that with a grain of salt, but I'm looking for some of kind of that ancillary information to help deduce like, hey, is there an actual opportunity to do what the value add that we can do so we can kind of take that into what we just talked about. Then kind of once, like you said, once, you know, the numbers make sense or the deals make sense, then you start to dig in. And, you know, that's where we really just, dig, you know, go down to the numbers, right? Look at the T12, look at where they are today on expenses, look at where, you know, we think we'll be on expenses, where, do, you know, what is the rent currently, right? What's the spread on, you know, just the rents, the market rents versus what they're marketing, right? Today, I mean, kind of, you know, we're really starting to put the bigger picture together, right? And then, you know, understanding is, hey, does this make sense at a high level, right? Yeah, and that's and us, then, you know, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I mean, we don't even look at the OM, right? You know, I mean, we're going straight from our <laughs> yeah. perspective, right? That just skews your, you'll get, you'll get the skinny from the broker, right? Because they'll usually, but the marketing package is the marketing package, right? Okay. You know, and I feel like that sometimes skews people's numbers when they look and concentrate on that a little bit too closely. So, you know, it, it's always best that if, if it passes your initial tests and you talk with the broker and there might be something there that you just go straight to the spreadsheet analysis, right? Because, you know, I mean, if you start trying to dissect what they're going to, what they have in terms of pro forma income and expenses, then you start getting that none those numbers in your mind. And, and guess what? They're, they're making those numbers work. So, yeah. you know, we, we always, we always go straight to that. And then only then do I then look at the OM and I see how far apart we are. And usually it's but, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's those classic sales tips, you know, like, you know, below, below replacement costs and all these things that they love to say, you know, that, that make it sound so sexy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, 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 it has to pencil out. It's all about the numbers. Yeah, I remember in, in one of the deal, I never really look at the OM until after I close because I need a logo for that property. And I see, hey, where is the logo? Then I call the... <laughs> Call the broker. Did you ever send an OM? See, yeah. Well, you want a floor plan, right? We've had that for the floor plan. You go back to the OM and grab the floor plan that they yeah, spent exactly. the time and effort on. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. need the floor plan and the logo from the OM. That's it. There you go. There you go. So yeah. um, it's interesting. And so, so the type of deals that you guys do. I mean, uh, where do you categorize? Is it value add, deep value add, or more on the you know yield play or core type of deals? So, I mean, right now we're focused on value add. I mean, we would like to do a more, you know, really to me, the ideal deal for us now, right? Given where we are, given, you know, our network, et cetera, is really kind of that B minus space, right? We've done a heavy value add. It's a lot of work, right? And, you know, those deals have worked out, they performed, but 
for us, I mean, it just, it consumes you right to some degree. And so, you know, we're trying to do lots of those, you know, and we try to vary it up, right. Always have, you know, a value add going on, having a stabilized going on just because, you know, from a bandwidth perspective, right. We can kind of handle one at a time, but we don't want to take on three big value adds at one time because then you get lost in that. And so I think for us, you know, we're typically in that C plus B minus space. It's really the, the focus for us. Yeah. yeah. One day we'll do an A deal, but not, <laughs> not, 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 but you yeah. know, it's, it's about matching it to the right equity pool, right? If we have equity, that's okay with the lesser returns, right? We can go do a B plus or an A minus, but so far, you know, we've been kind of in the C plus B minus space. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. So what about that, that strategy? Do you guys, do you guys uh, do on the agency loan bridge, bridge to uh, agency? I think we're doing a little, it's really deal dependent, right? You know I mean? I think, I think bridge has gotten a little bit of a bad rap, you know, I mean, there's, there obviously you have to be careful with it, right? You know, you have to understand your exit strategies. You have to be able to, you know, hit those targets in terms of, especially if it's a value add, it's got a little bit of hair on it, which is, it's going to with the bridge, right? You've got to be able to hit those timetables in terms of your construction and your rehab in order to refi out of it quickly and, and and at the best best price point that you can, right? You know, because obviously you don't want to have to bring money to the table. So, you know, we'll do a little bit of the bridge, but for the most part, you know, we're every just like every other smart operator, you're looking for agency debt when you can. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, we're looking to maximize returns for our investors, you know. And so sometimes, you know, going bridge versus agency has been a better way in, in order to do that. And People understand that there's, you know, there's there's a little bit higher of a risk tolerance with those, but you know, we always get a three-year term with two years extension. So at the end of the day, it's still five years, you know, on a bridge that, you know, it's not something like an 18-month deal. So I, I think that that gives, you know, people a little bit of, you know, um, you know, they feel a little bit better about it as well. But you know, we've done agency all the way up to 12 years too. So it's a little bit of both. Just depends on the deal. Yeah. For anyone listening, I mean, I think we have a PhD in the agency space. Unfortunately, we've had, we've had, we've had issues that people that do 50 deals never hit. So we've seen it all. And so if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. But, uh, you know, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly on the debt space. So it's, it's, you know, you kind of, you work through those problems, right? You get to closing, which is the good news, but then you kind of learn from it and, you know, start to figure out what are the things that could be learned from this to basically avoid the situation in the future. Right, we've had a, we've really seen a variety of things, unfortunately. Well, let's, let's That's where Ben lost all of his hair. <laughs> just, <laughs> just one, just one lender, which I'll tell if you want to if you want to email me, I'll tell you which lender it was. Yeah. Uh, okay, tell yeah, me no, the worst. Tell me the worst story in urgent agency. Just let's just go. The worst agency story. I'll, I'll tell you one, and this is one near and dear to you, James. So it's <laughs> it's in San Antonio. Okay, a San Antonio deal. It's a you know, a deal that pencils in really well. And for those of you that know on the agency side, right, with a Fannie loan, you can do what's called fully delegated, Mm -hmm. which means that Fannie lets the dust lender, which in our case, it could be Arbor, it could be Hunt, it could be any variety of them. For us, it it was an Arbor deal and lets them operate in their own capacity, right, to some degree. And so there's kind of a box. As long as they're within the box, Arbor can approve the deal, no questions asked. Well, you know, we're like three weeks from closing, pretty much at the finish line, money's in the bank, we, you know, we we're already looking at the next deal that we had going on. And then kind of going back, what happened was that because it's a San Antonio deal and the deal pencils in really, really well, right? From a you know, finance, financial perspective, the lender said, well, hey, we can go get you five years IO, right? And you know, we didn't think much of it, right? We thought, okay, that's fine. We'll at least back out to you know, where we are today because we were underwrote it at one year IO. Oh. Well, long story short, this deal essentially used to be on a watch list three years ago. These sellers, it's their only deal in San Antonio. They struggled with it. Plus, it was kind of whenever they're in the midst of a lot of rehab. So it got on the watch list. You know, it wasn't on the watch list the past few years. And that whole, you you know that market better than we do, James. I mean, that whole area has, you know, really turned around from where it was three years ago. Mm-hmm. But guess what? It was already flagged by Fannie and they just wanted to, you know, essentially get it off their books. Yeah. Right. And so this is something, you know, very I actually did this just the other day where I, I was talking to a broker about a deal and I asked him, was this ever on a watch list? That's something I've learned to ask now because, you know, and what sucks about it is that once a lender, a dust lender, in this case, Arbor went to Fannie, right? Once Fannie chimes in, Fannie is the authority, cool. right? Versus if we would have just not ever done that, we could have closed the deal agency with Arbor, no questions asked. And so it's a very unique situation. I don't know anyone that's actually ever encountered that, right? But these kind of things do happen. And so just knowing that they can happen and, you know, 
figure out how much risk you want to take because we would have been happy with what we had, what we could have closed, right? We were happy with the one year IO. That was great. That was fine. But it's, you know, you kind of get a little bit more than that. And then now, you know, completely bag of worms. So. Yeah, I learned, even I learned about this watch list in, in last week when I was looking at another deal and someone said, oh, I backed out because of watch list. I said, what is that? What is that, right? Then we realized there's so much other issues with the deal, right? So it just, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, for yeah. listeners, just FYI, when a, most dust lenders, they have one year authority on uh, delegated underwriting. So within... If they give one year IO, they don't have to go back to Fannie Mae and get approval. But once they go above that, they have to go to Fannie Mae, and a lot of things can yeah. change when it goes to Fannie Mae. Yeah. So you want to. Yeah. Yeah. So I've learned. So there's different <laughs> tiers, right? So there's the tier two, tier three. So if you're at a higher leverage, they can only give you one. But if you're willing to go down to 65, percent they can actually approve five years IO, okay. no questions asked. So you start to learn. And again, why did I learn that from a different deal? So you start to understand really the mechanics of what's going on behind the scene. And this is where having the right mortgage broker, you know, makes all the difference, right? They can help steer you in the right direction and help catch some of these. And, and so, I mean, for the, for the watch list, the sellers were actually more pissed than we were about the whole, they didn't think that was going to be an issue in terms of us getting the next one. Right. And so, okay. you know, they never thought to just close it. You don't think it's going to be an issue. Well, they thought, no, well, they thought that it was off too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, or supposedly, but you know, I mean, I think that that's, you know, just like with like our earlier part of the conversation, right? You know, we're, we're project managing these things. Things are going to pop up. So we were able to make it through that process Correct. and come out and, and, and still, you know, come out on top in terms of the debt. But, yeah, I mean, we're always looking to maximize returns and risk, you know, and, and minimize risk, you know, for our investors. And I think that, you know, having this different background and these different debt products and having a good experience with some of these different lenders really gives us a good, you know, um, broad overview of the debt market and which deals are going to make sense where. And I think that that's huge when, when you're looking at, you know, who to invest your money with. Because, you know, some people, let's be honest, they'll, they'll just go straight at Fannie. If it's not Fannie or if it's not Freddie, then I'm not doing it, right? Correct. You know, but I think sometimes you're missing out on opportunities there as well. So wasn't like three weeks before closing, didn't you guys had a rate lock at that time? No, we were supposed to rate lock a few days later. Oh, <laughs> like literally, they were just waiting on the final. Oh, because they, you know, they went to Fannie, and then Fannie kind of asked, you know, and this is where really I think we could have. It's about positioning the story, right? Again, you know, I think the lender just went in thinking that it was going to be an easy down the middle, because really that's what they told us, right? Okay. You know, they didn't even bother. We had a great story for the deal for the you know sponsorship team. They tried to do it retroactively, and kind of once Fannie chimes in, it's really hard to change. But uh, we were literally at the point of rate locking and, you know, getting, being done with this deal, like we were done. <laughs> so, yeah. so instead, you know, you do minute. a full 360 and search full 180 and change things and, you know, kind of redo. So in my mind, it was really, we took us two closings to get that deal done. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, dangerous to do it at the end because <clears throat> you're almost at the closing table. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that situation, just maybe to complete the story, right. You know, the seller realized kind of what happened. They, they gave us more time, right. They gave us another 30 days. They knew that wasn't really for lack of us or, you know, lack of anything that we did. And so we're able to buy more time and then redo the process and kind of, you know, get to where we needed to be. So did you do a different loan? Yeah. So that one, we called back every investor. Cause I mean, we basically, what we did, Arbor realized the mistake that they made, which was they should not have gone to the lender that, you know, to Fannie, they should have just closed. And so they basically gave us a balance sheet loan, right? Which is, it's, it's like a bridge loan on their books that essentially, you know, a short term just to get it off of Fannie's books okay. then in nine months, right? So for us, we kind of turned it into a value add refi scenario, okay. right? And okay. so in that, in that case, we will, you know, nine months, 12 months, somewhere around there, right? We're obviously pushing our NOI as hard as we can. We'll refi, pull equity out and get back into a Fannie permanent loan. Got it. And so, but you know, the deal changed, right? And so we had to call every investor tell every investor, here's what changed, here's what happened. And thankfully, pretty much everyone stayed in the deal, right? So that kind of, for us, that it's a sigh of relief, but also it's like, you know, we everyone just doubled down on us, right? So yeah, the deal's going to get babysat through the finish line. Yeah, the amount of pressure for you to go, you know, from, from under contract to rate lock, it's so much, right? So there's a lot of pressure on, on sponsors. Yeah. Because you have so much money tied. And you are under the gun and you have all your reputation out there. You know, you're doing the deal. Your investors are looking at you. You have to be a leader. And you have to be a really strong leader. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, a lot of absolutely. work. <laughs> so coming back to value add, right? 
So you guys do value add strategy. So what do you think is the most valuable value add? I think I think ultimately, what do, what do tenants care most about, right? I mean, whenever you're doing value add, unfortunately, you have to cure a lot of deferred maintenance. You gotta you gotta do a lot of things that you're not gonna get the best return on your investment on. But the two things that tenants care about, right? First being their interiors. So what what's actually in my unit? The second thing that they care about is amenities, right? And you know, I'd say it's probably a distant second. Most of the time with the workforce housing, they're caring about what their units look like. And I think that's where you're gonna get the best return on your investment when you're doing, you know, a, a value add. And then you can obviously update and add on amenities as a as a secondary thing to that. But unfortunately with those value adds, you gotta do things like roofs and HVAC replacements and other things that just people just say, hey, you know, if I'm running from you, I expect that to be working. So, you know, but you might be spending 100, 200 grand on some of this stuff, right? So your return on investment is almost nothing, but you have to do it. So you've got to balance those two things, right? You've got to work in curing that deferred maintenance along with how do I push the NOI and the revenue side by, you know, really updating the, the, the property for the way that the tenants are looking at it. So, I mean, that's kind of how we look at every value add product that we do is yeah. a combination of those two things. So, James, was your question really specific about ROI? Like, what are the things that we, you know, putting kind of deferred maintenance aside, what other things would we do to really try to maximize, you know, our return? Yeah, other than deferred maintenance, like roof and all the big stuff. Minus yeah, the so, I mean, it's yeah. it's property specific, right? It's really depending on the asset, what it looks like currently and what is the market doing. Right. Now that said, from our experience, right, the most common thing is flooring, two-tone paint, right? And you know, pimping out the kitchen to some degree. Right. And you know, you can go as crazy as replacing all the cabinets, or you really replacing the fronts, or even just putting fixtures, right? Like for us, fixtures is definitely cheap, easy to do. You know, it gives a different pop to the thing, right? Flooring almost always paint and really two-tone paint is is important. And you know, the other thing too that we like to do is really the, the Putting a backsplash. You can do backsplashes with this kind of stick on backsplash, really, really cheap to do per unit. And it gives the kitchen, which is usually, you know, 70s, 80s built kitchen, a bit of pop, right? It gives it something to modernize it, right? We didn't go as far as putting granite in, right? But you are putting that in kind of coupled with a resurfacing. It actually looks pretty good. And then, so, you know, the obvious is white and black appliances, right? So That's all, say, you know, white, black, or aluminum. Let's put. say on the interiors, right? So let's say you guys lost. For some reason, you thought you had 100% of your interior budget, but now you only have like 50% of the budget. What would you focus on on the interior? Yeah, if the property needed to be flooring and paint, right? The first flooring most important paint. things, I think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you got appliances too, right? But I mean, appliances, is, you know, you're going to be 2X in your, your interior budget just adding those in. But, yeah. you know, a lot of people, they think there's a price difference between white and, and black appliances or really not. But there's a perception that they're a little bit higher quality. So you can even do that too, right? You know, I mean, where you're really, you got to replace the appliances, but you're, you're, you know, you don't have a whole big budget for that. You can just go from white to black too, you know, and I think that adds a, a nice pop too. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, I realize that a lot of times if you have, if you give them even white, really nice appliances, people are happy, right? Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. new, right? It's, I mean, but like, you know, you'll see, you'll see people like they're just ecstatic that they've got black appliances. And right now the market is about the same in terms of pricing. So, Correct. you know, but it's just a perception thing or, or just, you know, like I said, a back a backsplash, 150 bucks, yep. you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, let, me, pillar. let me turn the question around to you, James. Would you, would you, same question to you, right? Would you do the same thing or would you do something else? So we, so for me, I think my most valuable value add would be just giving them good management, right? So, there's so many bad operators out there, which is mismanaging, not respecting the uh, tenants, uh, not taking care of it. So we just want to make sure really good management. That's on the management side. But if you go back to the interiors, I would say, uh, you know, of course, we do the appliances and we do the painting and flooring. That's what we would, I would say the most. So, yeah. but I think, I think a lot of people just love having good management, people who take care of them. You know, oh, be, absolutely. Like, I mean, they, they want to feel comfortable with who, who's there, right? People that understand what's going on. I mean, that's to me, and that's why for all of our properties, we're big on people, you know, putting, doing parties, doing tenant events, tenant retention events. Because, you know, 
from the operation side, right? You know, this is, you know, you have the back door and you have the front door, right? Uh-huh. If you don't have people renewing, right? You're going to have a, you know, a delinquency problem or not a delinquency problem. But you're going to have a, an occupancy problem. Right. And so really keeping people happy, renewing, right. Well, then it makes it easier on the front end to start the push rents, right. Because you have people that are enjoying working there, living there, right. It's, you know, for another 10, $20. Sure. You know, that's, it's more than the cost of moving. Right. And so that's, Absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. I think end of the day, tenants just want to be uh, felt appreciated. There's just so many properties out there, you know, are being, being mismanaged. Yeah, clean, quality, safe housing, man. I mean, it's, it seems so easy in, in, in the way that I describe it, but so many operators have just run some of these properties into the ground and, you know, um, and they don't take care of it, right? And so the tenants, therefore, don't consider it home and they don't take care of it. So when you get a good operator and then you get a good management company in there that, and they show that they're taking care of the property, then by default, you're going to get more loyal tenants. You're going to have people that are going to be more um, apt to, to take a, a renewal increase, you know, right. because they like they like coming home again. Right. It's home. Yeah, you know, versus yeah. just a place just to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the episode, uh, maybe episode five or six, I interviewed uh, Addy Lauren uh, from California Strategic Alliance, and, and he had been doing this for thirty years, more than one billion in transaction. And he told me very simple, clean, basic, and functional quality living is what his motto is. That's it, <laughs> right? So yeah, you don't have to get you don't have to get creative about it. Right. I mean, you know, the space that we plan is essentially workforce housing. I mean, across our whole entire portfolio, our average rents are less than a thousand bucks. Right. So folks aren't looking for crazy amenities and crazy things, even in their interiors. They just want, you know, a good quality place to come home to. And 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 the, and the management side is a big piece of that, too. Correct. And, you know, correct, she correct. brought up a good point. And, and another thing, too, with a good with good management, right, you get lower delinquency. So, mm-hmm. you know, for us, I mean, that's night and day. We had a deal that we one of our heavy value add deals were essentially where we were. I went back and looked at the numbers July versus where we are today. We, we have three times more revenue collected than we, we did before. Total, like literally straight revenue. You know, that's a combination of, you know, cutting back the delinquency, bringing units online, updating. But I mean, it's once people know that it's you know, someone taking care of the property and, you know, and enjoying it, people want to stay there, right? People are eating $200 rent pushes because guess what? This place has been completely turned around. You know, it's more family oriented and even just bringing more families on board helps cut back your delinquency. So yeah. for us, you're really looking at how do you build that community? And it's, you know, and some people are really cheap about it, but like, you know, hosting these parties is, you know, I mean, do the math, right? How much does it cost to go get hundred hot dogs and hundred burgers, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's very, very cheap, <laughs> right? To, to, you know, grill it out, have like a little patio, you know, a party, whatever it is. These things are almost, you know, half of a unit's rent a month, right? <laughs> it's kind of thing. And so they're almost rounding areas, areas where we are, but guess what? It changes the dynamics of the property. And so, I mean, some people don't really, people are very short-sighted, I see. And, you know, really it has a much bigger kind of longer term impact. And yeah. I think, you know, I mean, going along with the value add, right? I mean, you know, a lot of what we're doing is repositioning the property too, which is kind of where you're going with this, James. It's it's bringing in better management. You're getting in a better tenant profile at the same time too. So that's part of the value add strategy as well. You know, so once you and once you show them that you care, you've got tenants in there that care, then the property just starts performing. There's a whole the energy shift is 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 palpable. You know, I mean, you go from a bad energy deal to a very good energy deal and you have less delinquency, you have better occupancy, you have people more apt to take a, a, a you know, a, a renewal increase and you can, you can rent that out more easily because people that prospective tenants that are walking around feel that same thing too. So that's a huge part of what we do. We don't like to focus the value add just on, you know, the, what the, the, the aesthetic of the property too. It's how you manage it and, the tenants that you have in there as well. It's a huge part of it. So you guys are operators, which is what the definition, what I mean is we are very active asset management because you know the details of what's happening on the side by side, right? So yep. is, that, is that a correct assumption, right? Mm-hmm. So absolutely. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How do you guys manage these third party property management companies? Man, that, that's that's part of the the secret sauce. <laughs> but I mean, it's really is nothing to it. There's nothing secret about it. So you know, we have an asset manager now that we've brought in who very experienced. You know, twenty plus years. Family is a property manager family, really, and so that's starting to help. But we plan to keep a pulse in general on what's going on in every deal. And so 
for us, it's really about putting systems in place with each of your property managers, right? And having accountability, right? And so we have not brought in property management in-house, but we've been successful with managing our property managers, right? And, you know, and it's a partnership, right? It's not like they're your employee, right? You really need to get, you know, on the level of like where they understand like, hey, we're partnering, we're growing together, right? And so they've seen that. And, you know, you identify the good property managers from the bad. So there's a whole vetting cycle I don't want to get too far into, but really, you know, we have the weekly calls, we have the weekly reports come in at a certain time, we have certain expectations. And, you know, within a few days, we expect them to follow up with here all the action items and did these all get done? Yes or no, why not? Right. And how do we, you know, again, keep them accountable? So, yeah. Yeah. It's all about, you know, obviously keeping to an agenda, keeping to the, the processes that we put in place, the templates, the checklists, you know, and, and we're very upfront when we, when we, get into a partnership with these property management companies that this is what we expect and this is when we expect it. Right. You know, and then we, like we said, we keep them accountable. through. Yeah. And this is the format teams. that we expect. And these are the numbers that we need or sent out, you know, just okay. to help us track everything the way we want. And then you learn from it, right? We're not perfect. It's not, it's an iterative process, right? Anytime we, we identify something that we can improve from one property manager, we, we apply to the portfolio. That's what the nice yeah. thing is really is that, Having different property managers, we see the strengths and weaknesses of each property manager and you figure out how do we make them all better? And so what things can we do across the board to make everything better? Yep. So can you name like uh, three things that you guys always look out for in the property management performance when you realize that some one of these three things is not going well, things are not going right? You know, like, Man, I would say renewals is the lowest hanging fruit. <laughs> Look and understand what's going on with renewals and how important it is because really renewals is indicative of a lot of other things. Are they following up with tenants for the renewal, right? Did they, you know, really that's just the, that's the number that you can kind of look at and realize that there must be other problems going on. <laughs> I would say okay. that's my answer. I don't know about you, Ben. No, boy, no I think, yeah, I think you're right, man. Totally. Yeah. I think, but uh, you know, my biggest, my biggest hanging out is delinquency because it's like, that's yeah. the property's money. Like, you know, go out there. How are you going to collect the rent that we're, that we're owed? And so when you start seeing that slipping and we're increasing, you know, that's my big red flag that, Hey, you know, there's something going on here, right? Is our, is our, is our management on site not, not doing their job or are we getting bad tenants in there that aren't capable of paying the rent that we're, we're asking of them? I mean, what's the, there's a, there's usually a bigger problem going on, but yeah, I mean, all of these these metrics we expect on our Monday morning report. And so we're looking at each of these things weekly. And we're also having follow-up calls throughout the week, too. Either our asset management or asset manager or us are having calls with the property manager to track these things. So it's not like a weekly thing and then we don't have any kind of insight into what's happening for the rest of the week. You know, if there's if there's a challenge, we're having a follow-up call that week about it as well. Okay. So do you convert like renewal to percentage and look at, give that as a goal? Is that what you guys, and delinquency it to a percentage and give that as a goal? It's no. a balancing act depending on how hard you're pushing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can just say, hey, we expect 50% renewals across the board. I think it's really, it's deal specific. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we're, we're looking at renewals, we're looking at leases, we're looking at delinquency, right? We're looking at, you know, how much traffic came in versus how much leases got closed and then going in and, you know, really both on, Leases we didn't close. What's the story? What's the story? What's the story? Sometimes there's cases where you, maybe you you know you can go save that that person. Similarly, on the delinquency we go through, what's this person's story? Are they going to pay? Because really in Atlanta, our delinquency is higher than it is you know in in Texas, right? It's just by nature of the market, and so you you know you, you kind of need to be more flexible in one market versus the other, and so really you go through and understand what's the story behind it. Just like whenever we <laughs> you asked me earlier about the properties that we analyze, you're looking for that story. And so we talk through each one of these and figure out what makes sense to kind of do moving forward. Cause it, it, to us, it's, it is very different between different properties. Yeah. And I would say target for delinquency, right? It's always zero. And, and you know, I mean, some of the property management companies will say, Oh yeah, we're got zero across our whole portfolio. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I mean, not, not the, not the workforce housing stuff. So you got to be realistic, but I would say your, your, your target there is probably one to 2%. You know, on a stabilized property, if you're if you're dealing in the workforce housing space that we are, you know, and you know, so that's usually the metric that we're we're pushing towards. But on the renewal side too, one thing that I want to point out, right, when you're doing a heavy value add and you've got a lot of interior budget to kind of burn through, and you have units that you need to update too, right? You're not going to be chasing after those folks as aggressively as you would on a stabilized property because. Maybe you don't have a lot of down units or a lot of, you know, vacancy and you need to free up 
you know, units to actually update them, right? So you're not going yeah. to be as aggressive in renewing those folks. So it's yeah, a we, balancing we act, like Ferris says, right? I mean, yeah. you, gotta, you, want, you don't want to, you're not going to burn that bridge completely. So you're constantly looking at occupancy, you know, versus how much, you know, how many units are we supposed to be turning a month in order to hit that target of, you know, 60, 70, 80 units a year, right? You know, because people, if people are moving out, what are we going to do? We can't sit on the money. There's usually a finite amount of time that we can, we can actually use that cash. So to to expand on Ben's point too, it's almost like, you know, we have a deal where we almost want the opposite. We don't want renewals, (laughs) you know? And what I mean by that is that with one of our deals in Atlanta, we've pushed rents an insane amount on this deal. Like we're probably up 30%, honestly. Mm -hmm you know, 30, 40%. And we still have 98% occupancy. Our joke with our property manager is that one day on the call, it fell to 97 and a half. And then, you know, we, we, we called her out on it. Like, Oh, you're at 97 and a half. You're not at 98% anymore. And she's like, no, no, I just had someone sign and renew. So she's back at 98. And, you know, but in that deal, we have interior budget that we need to go spend, but we we're literally just sitting on the sidelines, right. Trying to, you know, see where kind of that balancing act is. Cause we knew it was below market. Right. And figure out, you know, where can we land on to where we have some people not renewing and we can go in and actually spend the money to even get, you know, that better push. Yeah. I think you need to look for where's the base, right? Where's the base, right? Before you really go and spend all that rehab money, right? Otherwise you can't be spending, spending, spending. And exactly. You don't know where's your base, where's your starting point, right? So Mm -hmm. yeah, I've had properties where we didn't even spend rehab money yet, but we already bump up just because people like it, just because we are just a a better operator than the previous guy. Right. So, and you'll get that, right. You know I mean? You'll just, you're you're amazed at, you know, how much they'll take on a renewal too. And that's great. You know, I mean, I just think it's a balancing act sometimes, but yeah, you have to, you have to kind of see where the market is and, and obviously be strategic with those dollars as well. Yeah, correct, correct. That's right. That's right. So can you give us some advice on how do you choose third party property management? Because you guys are going in multiple markets, right? How would you give them expectation? Because a lot of I'm sure a lot of property management company don't like, you know, active asset managers. <laughs> control <freaks> like <laughs> this, I guess. <laughs> well, hey, oh, trust me, trust me, they then not, I, think, I guess. Yeah, I, think, I don't think that they like people like us. Well, right? I would say though, all of our property managers, literally, you ask them, they say we're one of their favorite oh, okay. clients, and it's not because maybe we're active or inactive. <laughs> it, well, it's we're doing maybe some of it, but it's more so that we're realistic, right? I think okay. what I was surprised to hear from them is a lot of people will just tell their property manager, here's your budget, and here's what you have to go, you know, accomplish. And sometimes it's not realistic. Right. So before any of our deals close, we've already worked on a budget with a property manager. We have an agreement on what that looks like, what the plan is. And we're not just picking numbers out of a hat just to make our deal work. Right. We really kind of do it the other way around. And then, you know, whenever issues come up, we're both, I mean, hopefully people on the, the audience that uh, get this impression, Ben and I are pretty level headed, pretty easy to work with. And so, you know, they understand things happen. And so, you know, the property management companies, at least they enjoy because we're easy to get a hold of. We understand what's going on in the deal. And, you know, we're, we're realistic. And so, cause I've asked them and, you know, pretty much all of them have said that we're one of, you know, we're, we're one of their favorites. Right. And so okay. now, you know, that said, maybe to answer your question, Ben, do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be stern, but I mean, at the same time, you can have a friendly <laughs> relationship with them at the same time. Right. But I think it's all about setting, setting the right expectations, you know, um, and, and just vetting them in general. I, I think it's, it's all that you, you, you usually start off with referrals, okay. right? But, you know, I think some of the big things are, is, you know, go take a look at some of their properties too. go secret shop those deals, you know? So you're going to say, okay, Hey, you're, you're a good referral on whatever market, right? You know, give me three of the assets that you, and then you fly out there and you go shop them. You know, what does the property look like? Is it clean? You know, is the management or is the, is the leasing agent and the, and the manager, are they, you know, are they friendly? Are they knowledgeable of the property? Are they good? Are, are they leasing it properly? I mean, all of these things go back to the property management side. And, and as long as that, that, that kind of coalesces with what you've heard about them and, and everything is, is good, you know, obviously, you know, the fee has to be in line and, and the referrals have the references have to be there. But, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest asset test for us is, you know, vetting the deals that they currently have and do we like what we see? You know, and, and they call them out, right? I mean, if they don't, if there's if there's a deficiency saying, hey, you know, we went and went to XYZ property and there was 
trash on the ground. You know, what's the deal with that? You know, and then how do they respond to that? Because, you know, that's going to be, there's always challenges, but it's how you respond to those challenges is, is what I'm looking for on the property management side. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then a couple of things too, just to add, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, it's about what's the, kind of, what's the impression and feeling you're getting from them, right? And, and working on a budget with a property management company is actually a great exercise to understand how they look at things and how, you know, are they going to meet what you're looking for? And I mean that in multiple ways, right? A, are they, is their budget realistic? Right. And B is their pushback. I mean, we, we actually like when they push back, right? If we say, well, we think we can run payroll at X amount. And they're like, well, no, payroll is going to be this amount. Here's the 10 properties we have nearby to prove it. Right. That's good. Versus we've had property managers that are essentially yes people, right. That'll say yes to everything. And that's not at all what you want because we need something realistic. We're not trying to, you know, we have millions of dollars at stake. We have other people's money. We're not here to just take a gamble. So, you know, looking at that and kind of what we found success in is really the people that are in that five to 15,000 unit range, right? The 40,000 guys are too much. They don't care about you. The guys that are smaller, you know, there's just a lot of, you know, this firsthand, there's a lot of back office that needs to happen for a successful property management company. Right. And so, you know, we found that sweet spot seems to be that five to 15. And then, you know, to where their our portfolio is enough volume for them, right. That we kind of get that professional, preferential treatment where needed. And at the same time, right. They're developed enough to be able to, you know, kind of take on and succeed with it. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. Very interesting. So let me ask some question about more on the personal side, right? So maybe each one of you can add in or on your own side. So what's, what do you think is the top three things that is secret sauce, you know, for, for the success that you guys have been having in terms of closing deals? All right. Go for it, man. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. I'd say partnerships and relationships, right? Most important, first and foremost, right? Being willing to partner with brokers, property managers, other partners, partners right on the GP, people that can help us, you know, with the deal, right? Whether it's helping with construction, helping with equity, whatever it is. I think that's been one thing. Um, another one is just differentiating ourselves a little different, right? Doing things a little bit different than what the norm is, right? Not doing the same thing as everyone else, finding ways to be unique, right? Whether it's you know, putting on our conference, whether it's formatting our emails a certain way, doing our webinars a certain way, right? We really do look at how do you do these things differently. Um, and then third, I'd say, I mean, I mean, maybe it's going back to the basics, running it like a business, right? A lot of people, it's a side hustle, right? But really, it's a business. There's a method to the madness and doing, you know, things in that way, right? Our goal is to do 100 deals. Our goal is not to do one, two, three deals and retire. Right. And so how do you build up the track record for that? How do we, you know, keeping our fee structure simple, right? We're, we don't have 10 fees like some people do, right? Our goal is really simple fee structure. Cause again, we're not out to just, you know, make a quick buck on one or two deals and then disappear. And so I think I'd say those are maybe the three, three things that we've done that have helped us kind of succeed. You want to add, uh, you know, and just, you know, add on to what Ferris, I mean, those are, those are probably my top three. I'll just add a few extra ones that I, that I kind of see. I, I made it hard for Ben, but pick me. I know, right? <laughs> You know, I, I think I think the biggest thing for your listeners is you gotta take action, right? You know, I mean, we can we can hear about it, we can read about it, we can go to conferences and see other people talk about it, but at the end of the day, you've got to get out there, you gotta start talking to brokers, you gotta start underwriting deals, and you gotta start making offers. And if you're if you're not willing to to work and do and go the extra mile, you're never gonna be successful in this business. And I think that's where me and Ferris are we're burning the candle at both ends. I mean, we're working both you know, <laughs> evenings and weekends and 12 hour days. And, you know, some people just aren't willing to do that, right? They're not willing to put in the work and take action and get it done. So I think that that's another thing. That's another reason why I think we've been successful too, right? And I think, you know, going back to running it as a business too, I think the other thing is, is, is we're pouring all of the money into the business as well to improve those processes and then, and, and establish a good platform that we can then grow the business even even bigger in the future. And I think a lot of people, they do they, one or two or three deals, they retire and then they're taking all the money out of those one or two or three deals. And then they really can't build from there. There's no foundation because they've taken it all away. And so I think that's another thing that Disrupt Equity has done a very good job at is we've poured all the money back into making Disrupt Equity better and then continuing to improve on that. And I think that's another thing that differentiated us from uh, you know, some, some other folks that are in the space. 
Yeah. So um, interesting. Mm -hmm. So let me ask one, two questions, but I'm going to ask each one of you at the same time. So why do you do what you're doing right now, right? What's your big why? And describe some, you know, some important habits that you think in your life that's making that success happen. So I'm going first on this one, man. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it, 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 oh, but I can just say, yeah, ben, 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 whatever Ben said. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's individual. No, no, it's I, basic no, no, the, the why is important for everybody, every individual out there, right? You've got a why. And, and I think mine is my family, right? You know, I, I, I'm out here right now while I'm young, hustling so I can buy back time, you know, so I can, I can retire and I'm putting that in quotations in three to five years because I'm never going to retire. Right. But I want to, you, you want to get to a point where you can do the business when you want to do the business from wherever you want to do the business. Right. You know, this is not, you don't always, unless you're just doing the property tour or you're, you're doing your due diligence, everything else can be remote. So, you know, for us, you know, we want to get to that point. So, you know, my why is, I'll put in the time now so I can spend more time with my family, you know, even more time with my family and, and be able to provide for them, you know, wherever I was not being able to be provided for whenever I was growing up. Right. So you're always wanting to give your children more than what you got when you're when you were younger. And that's that's my biggest thing, too. Right. And to show them that you can build something from scratch and, and, and go out and be successful in this in, in, in this country. And I think that that's important to show your children as well. So that's another big why for me, you know, um, what about you know, daily, the, daily habits? I think daily habits, I think, you know, for, from my perspective, I think it's, it's all about time blocking. You know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of this and I'm, hey, it's, it's, it's a struggle, right? You know, everybody has to continue to do that, but you need to, you need to time block your day out for, for specific things because otherwise you've got messages coming in, you've got text messages, you've got phone calls, you've got meetings, you've got emails, you've got all these different things, right? We need to say, okay, from nine to 10, I'm going to just do this. And you completely block out the rest. And then from 10 to 11, I'm going to do this. Right. And that is really, and once again, it's a constant, it's a, it's a struggle. I'm still improving on that, but as I've gotten better at that, you know, it, it's gotten easier. And then also the other thing that I'm a big proponent of is, is just action item list. You know, I mean, every day before I leave the office, I'm writing out a list of important things that I need to be doing. And I stick to that very rigidly too. Right. I mean, if I get to the end of the day and I haven't done something, I'm like, okay, I, you know, that's, that's not one of those things I'm just going to roll over. Right. I mean, there's a reason why I had it in that day. And so I stick to that, you know, and, and you know, a lot of this can be automated too. I just jot it down because it just helps me memorize it. But for me, I think those two things have really helped me structure my day where I've been more productive, you know, than I was in the past. And, you know, so that's, that's kind of helped me grow and be able to, to multitask and, and do some of the stuff that we've done in the commercial real estate space. For us, yes. Yeah. All right. So Ben kind of took my thunder, but uh, you know, it's the same why, right? Family and kind of doing that. The other part, yeah, I don't want to go too far into that one. The other thing too, to me is just the challenge, right? Building a, you know, successful large company from thin air for lack of a better word, right? Where people will enjoy coming to work, you know, work there. And at the same time, you know, you're providing income to all the employees, you're providing good housing to all the tenants. And, you know, being able to take on that deep value add where you take the diamond, uh, the, sorry, not the diamond, you're taking the rough property in the area and turning it into the diamond, right? And seeing kind of the, just the, the tenant's eyes light up, right? That's actually, you know, I didn't expect that, I guess, but from one of our deals we did, it was actually pretty cool to see where they just enjoy, you know, living there, right? I mean, from where it was before. And so, you know, kind of to me, the combination of the two is pretty awesome to, to experience and see what so that's your, probably the other why what about your yeah. daily habits daily habits man systematizing the hell out of everything <laughs> <laughs> and so bringing software into things where i can and you know keeping everything you know accounted for and measured and rolling forward right and so both personally and the company and so you know, I, I don't do yoga at 5 a.m. in the morning. I'd love to. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm more of a night person than a morning person. You know, I'll be first to admit that. I'd love to, I, although I feel like I'll admit I, I, I need to be better about consistency, right, with my schedule. But I mean, definitely time blocking, that's important. I think both Ben and I do that, right? You know, we're basically Ben, you know, doesn't work from five to seven. And then I don't work from seven to nine. The rest of the 22 hours we work now, <laughs> you know, but we, we, you know, time blocking is important keeping everything tracked because 
you know, the sausage making for syndication, I mean, it, it's a lot of project management, going back to what we started the conversation right. with, right? Keeping everything diligently tracked and, you know, to where you don't drop the ball on something because guess what? Your investors see that, your property managers see that, your partners see that. And so whenever they see that, you know, things don't get dropped, right? It creates a different dynamic. Got it. Got it. Is there anything else that you guys want to share with the listeners that you think, hey, I want to share this because I think it's a good tip and uh, oh, I've never shared it in any of the podcasts? Um, <laughs> let me think about that one. Now you guys are thinking. That's right. We try to just dump it all as we think about it. Paris is going first on this one. Uh, <laughs> He's scratching his uh, let's see. A uh, big important tip. Um, yeah. Anything man, to me, I'm going to reiterate. It's one I mentioned earlier softly, but it, it's the follow up with the brokers. People keep saying there's not deals to be had, but it's it's all timing. Did you call the broker on the right day that the deal happened to fall through, and that now they they're more motivated? Right. Mm -hmm. Example. Or did you follow up whenever the deal blew up and the seller is really determined? Right. Or is it the day that the broker is going to lose the exclusive and they're looking to get something in front of the seller? Right. So the seller doesn't have to start over the process. I mean, it's that's how you find the deals, man. You really got to get out there having the conversations. Keep, you know, another thing we didn't even talk about is CRM and tracking notes of brokers and all that stuff. I mean, you know, my, my brokers are my friends. Right. And I mean that not just from a business perspective, but like, you know, legitimately, right? You try to build friendships, try to, I send them pictures of things. I do all this random stuff to build rapport, right? Just to be more front and top, front and center and top of mind. That, that's what helps you get the deals. And so, you know, being willing to kind of go out and about and do that, I think is, is key to kind of finding deals right now in this environment. And I, and I think just as a, as a good segue for that, you know, I think on the equity side, I think what, what our investors are looking for and what all investors are looking for, right? Is, somebody that's that they're genuine they're transparent they're open they're honest and they're and they're willing to answer some of these questions a lot of these people they're getting into the space they're investing in deals but they want to they want to eventually probably do their own deals right so they're kind of trying to answer questions and i've seen a lot of people that just they block that out they don't answer questions they're not helpful you know and, and so you know from us we try to go the extra mile with our investors and and people that are looking to get in the space and you know, we're not doing any coaching or mentoring. We have no desire to do that, but we answer a lot of questions. And I think that that has been very, very helpful for us, you know, in, in, in lining up equity partners for our deals because people appreciate that type of stuff. So that fair is kind of handed on how do how we're getting deals and I'm kind of hitting on how we're getting money. And, and this stuff's not rocket science. It's just, you know, getting out there and actually just doing what you need to be doing. And, uh, you know, there's still, there's still stuff out there, still deals out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and I think project management is something that you know, if if any listeners, uh, you guys, uh, I mean, I think that's an important skills. You know, if you are working right now a W two job, and if your company is offering, or if you want to go do some project management classes, you know, it's very very useful, especially in real estate, uh, uh, like you know, on a syndicated deal as well, because everything is yeah. so many moving parts there, right? So. Thanks for coming for the show. And can you tell the listeners how can they find you guys? Where's the best place and fastest way to get hold of you guys? All right. All right. So uh, uh, go to our website, www.disruptequity.com is our website. And then Ben at disruptequity.com, Ferris at disruptequity.com. One thing that we did want to mention, we do host, you know, uh, some conferences each year. We're going to be in LA June 22nd. So uh, if you, if this drops before then or or even after then, check us out, mfinvestornetwork.com. These are no sales pitch events. We're just bringing our friends up that are industry leaders, you know, doing a lot of speaking, a, a lot of panels, and just giving back a lot of knowledge that we've learned over the years in this space, and people seem to enjoy that stuff. So, you know, check us out on that website as well. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you guys for coming into the podcast and uh, thanks for all the value that you guys given. I think it was a really good discussion. There's a lot of details being discussed and I think I'm sure the listeners will be appreciative of that. Thank you. We appreciate awesome. it. Happy to. Thank you. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audio book. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. 
To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.